Well, hello and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight, uh, tonight's LPLS talk on 100 years of insulin. Um, uh, I'm Eric Blair. I'm president of the Leeds Phil and Lit Society. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Kirsten Hall uh, as our speaker tonight. Um, uh, Rachel will introduce Kirsten uh, in detail in a moment, but um, just on a, on a personal level, uh, it's a great pleasure always to introduce Kirsten because uh, Kirsten and I have known each other for many, many years. And indeed we've, we've worked together and uh, Kirsten has made the transition of being a, a, an, an excellent uh, scientist and molecular biologist uh, to um, an, an excellent historian of science and molecular biology. Um, so it's a, it's a very great pleasure to have you here tonight, Kirsten. And also, uh, uh, Kirsten is probably quite modest, but he's, he's written uh, an excellent book on this subject uh, about insulin and also uh, about um, uh, William Asper, one of the big figures in structural molecular biology in Leeds. So um, uh, th th this is going to be an excellent talk. And uh, uh, insulin, of course, was one of the, the first big money spinners that, that came from the biotech uh, revolution. So that there's, uh, there's lots to hear about and lots to think about here. So um, uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Kirsten. And I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to introduce Kirsten. Well, Eric, thank you very much. And uh, you said some of the main things that we that we really do need to know about Kirsten and his background. So his degree is from Oxford and he came to Leeds to do his PhD and uh, then spent some time as a research fellow in the School of Medicine and it then became a visiting fellow in the philosophy, religion and the history of science. And he's one of these marvellous people who can manage to communicate um, across from you know, something that's highly technical and involved uh, to enable those of us who don't at all have that kind of background to understand uh, the main line of really important stories. So these people that uh, Eric mentioned, William Asprey and Florence Bell, involved in the long story of the uh, determining the structure of DNA uh, in which Leeds has played such an important role. Uh, and they deserve to be better known. And uh, having done all this work on innovation in Leeds, and we featured William Asprey in our book on innovation, thanks to Kirsten, you know, I know very well that it, it's important to sing the praises of people who should be better recognised. Anyway, here's another story that Kirsten has devoted himself to. And uh, I'll hand over to you now, and uh, we look forward to hearing it. Thanks, Kirsten. I'm going to pin your video now. Am I pinned? Um, just, uh, I, you are now. <laughs> I am. Oh, listen, hey, Rachel, thanks very much for that introduction. Likewise, Eric, thank you. Um, well, pressure's on now, isn't it? I mean, um, threefold, I think, as well. Um, thanks to you all for coming along and opting to sit and listen to me harping on about insulin rather than enjoying the sunshine tonight or the England match. Um, and also, there is, a, there is a former teacher of mine from way, way back in the days of O-Level in the audience, so I am really feeling the pressure tonight. Let's... Let's hope that this talk's good enough to get me a good comment in my work record book. Um, so, 100 years of insulin. Where I want to start with this tonight is a little bit of audience participation. Um, I want to throw a question out to all of you. And that question is, how, how do you think you would feel if your phone was to ring and a friend on the other end was to tell you that you just won the Nobel Prize? Um, I'm willing to hazard a guess. And I, the, uh, what your response would be. Um, I gave this talk a few months ago to some sick formers and one very worldly wise, some might say cynical young chap there, put his hand up and said, I'd think it was a scam call. Um, he would probably go very far in life, I suspect. That's the situation, though, that this chap here, Canadian scientist Fred Banting, found himself in one morning in October 1923 his phone rang and it was the phone call that I think every scientist must secretly dream of receiving. He picked it up and there was an excited friend on the other end of the line saying, have you seen the morning newspaper? Because you've just won the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. 
And Banting's response to that news was not what you might have expected. What his response was, we shall come to shortly. I shall leave you hanging there for a minute with that one. I'll move on to what he won that Nobel Prize for, and that was the discovery of insulin 100 years ago this year, 1922. Why was that such a milestone? Well, before the discovery of insulin, basically a diagnosis of certainly type 1 diabetes was a certain death sentence. Basically, the best that doctors could do for patients was to put them on a starvation diet um, just to delay the inevitable slide into a fatal coma. So no wonder then that clinicians were delighted with the discovery of insulin, even though chemically, none of them actually knew what this stuff was. One clinician just described it as being 15 cc's of thick brown muck, a vial of which you can see here on the left. Now, if you fast forward by about six decades to the end of the 70s, insulin was getting people excited again. But this time, it wasn't doctors that were getting excited. It was dealers on Wall Street. And that was all thanks to a little fledgling biotech company called Genentech. And what they had been able to do was, well, what you've got to understand is until that time, people with diabetes were able to inject themselves with insulin recovered from cow or pig pancreatic tissue now for the first time. Thanks to the scientists at Genentech, patients could inject themselves with human insulin because what they'd been able to do was they'd been able to genetically engineer an ordinary bacterium so that it could actually produce human insulin. And it's said that Genentech made what was then the most spectacular debut in stock market history. So what we're going to do on, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to go on a whirlwind tour. We're going to go from 1920s Toronto to the sunny blue skies of mid to late 1970s California. But we're also going to take in the somewhat more leaden grey skies of 1940s Leeds because I think that Leeds played a really crucial role in this act of modern day alchemy that transformed this thick brown muck here on the left into Wall Street gold that was getting the traders so excited when Genentech floated in October 1980. But I think the place where we really need to start with that is a quick, um, a quick study of what exactly is going on in diabetes. So this side of the Atlantic, it's half past seven in the evening. So I'm guessing most people will have had their evening meal. In which case, chances are you've probably eaten some carbohydrates in the form of potatoes, bread, rice, pasta. And what carbohydrates are, they are long chains of sugar molecules joined together. And when they get into your gut, the links between those chains are broken and those sugars pass from your gut into your blood. And they're transported around your body, in your blood, to the tissues that are going to burn that sugar for energy. And here's the crucial thing. That sugar can't get out of your blood into those tissues without the action of the hormone insulin. And insulin is made by the pancreas. That's an organ that just sits under the stomach. Specifically, the insulin is made in these little patches of cells called the islets of Langerhans because they were discovered by a PhD student called Paul Langerhans and they look like islets. So that's all well and good when things are working and someone's healthy. What about when things go wrong? So broadly speaking, now this, a lot of diabetes clinicians would say this is a vast oversimplification, but it's helpful to think of two forms of diabetes, type one and type two. Type two is the more common one. That's the one that's really on the rise now um, and is really going to cause problems, I think. It's the one that is caused when your body is making insulin, but for reasons that we, for, for complex reasons that can be all to do with genetic background and lifestyle, your body's lost its sensitivity to that insulin. The other form, the one that we're really going to focus on tonight, the less common form, type one. Well, in that case, your body's simply not producing insulin because what's happened there is your own immune system that's there to protect you from viruses and bacteria, again, for reasons we don't really understand, has turned on these insulin producing cells in the pancreas and it's destroyed them. It's recognized them as foreign. It's attacked them. It's destroyed them. So 
in origin, type 1 diabetes, it's an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, lupus. Those are all autoimmune diseases. But whether type 1 or type 2, the end result is the same. Either you're not making insulin or you're making it and your body's not responding to it. That means the sugar that you're eating in your diet can no longer get from your blood into the tissues that need it for fuel. And so the concentration of sugar in your blood goes up and up and up. That leads to what's probably the most common symptom of the onset of diabetes because the kidneys start going into overdrive to try and clear all that sugar out of your body um, by flushing it out in the urine. And as I say, that's probably the most common symptom of the onset of diabetes. Um, it's been known about for a long time. The ancient Egyptians knew about it. There's a, there's a scroll from around about 3000 BC that talks about a medicine to drive away the passing of too much urine. And in fact, that symptom is actually where diabetes gets its name from. It was the uh, second century BCE, second century CE uh, physician, sorry, Arateus. He coined the name diabetes, comes from the ancient Greek meaning to flow or to siphon. And in fact, Arateus gave this fantastic description of diabetes. He said, it consists of a liquefaction of the flesh and the bones into urine, the kidneys and the bladder. The usual passages of fluid do not cease emitting urine. It is as though aqueducts were opened wide. The development of this disease is gradual, but short will be the life of the man in whom the disease is fully developed. Emaciation proceeds quickly and death occurs rapidly. Life for the patient is tedious and full of pain. The desire for drink grows ever stronger, but no matter what quantity of fluid he drinks, satisfaction never occurs and he passes more urine than he drinks. But I think if you were going to give a prize for the most vivid, colourful and memorable name for diabetes, uh, we would have to give that prize to the 17th century English physician, Thomas Willis, who described diabetes thus. And I'll, I'll let you read that for yourselves. But frequent trips to the bathroom are probably the least of your worries because those high levels of sugar in your blood can cause a number of other really serious complications. So here's a few. So one thing elevated sugar levels in the blood will do over a long period of time is they'll damage the retinas in the sensitive tissue uh, at the back of the eye. And I think if I got my figures right, diabetes is the biggest cause of blindness in the UK. Another one is damage to the peripheral limbs, usually through ulceration. Um, this is probably one of the more palatable pictures I found when I was preparing this talk. I made the mistake of typing into Google diabetic leg and foot ulcers while I was eating my breakfast one morning. Um, do not do that. You will regret it. Other problems, increased predisposition to cardiovascular disease, increased predisposition to stroke and increased risk of infections. And that's particularly been an issue in the past two years with SARS-CoV-2. But of all those, probably the biggest danger in the end is the fact that because you're either not making insulin or you're not responding to it, your body can't burn sugar, it needs to find an alternative source of fuel. So to do that, it turns to burning protein and fat which is again why one of the common symptoms of the onset of type 1 diabetes is a sudden weight loss. Burning that fat and protein gives you energy in the short term, but it also produces a type of poisonous compound called ketones, which will acidify the blood and they'll eventually put you into a fatal coma. And as I said, this was basically the fate of anyone who had diabetes before the discovery of insulin. So no wonder then, that the clinicians were jubilant when insulin was discovered 100 years ago. One of them, very eminent diabetes clinician, Dr. Elliot Jocelyn in Boston, he was so stunned by the power of insulin to pull his patients back from the brink of death that he, he found himself comparing it to the vision of Ezekiel. He was a, a man of faith. Um, so Ezekiel was a prophet in the Old Testament who is supposed to have seen this, this valley of dry bones rise up, be clothed in flesh and restored to life. And for Jocelyn, this was the effect that insulin was having on his emaciated, starved patients. However, one person who maybe wasn't turning cartwheels was young Dr. Fred Banting, who we met at the start. 
So as I said, October 1923, Banting gets the phone call from a friend saying that he's just won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin. And he is utterly furious at that news. Livid. He tells his friend to go to hell, slams down the phone receiver, checks the morning newspaper. Yep, it's true. And then he jumps into his car and he drives across Toronto in a rage. In fact, in such a rage that some onlookers feared he was going to turn violent. What was he so angry about? Well, here's the morning newspaper. So you'll see it. Toronto Doctors Honoured, Nobel Prize to Banting, and then in small print underneath that, Dr. J.J.R. McLeod also. So that's John McLeod. He's the gentleman with the tash on the right there. And he was Banting's boss, professor of physiology at the University of Toronto. And Banting loathed him. Banting absolutely hated this guy. And he felt that McLeod had no right whatsoever to have any share in the credit for the discovery of insulin with him. In fact, I'll read you a little extract from one of Banting's journals where he offered up his thoughts on McLeod. He said, McLeod, on the other hand, was never to be trusted. He was the most selfish man I've ever known. He sought every possible opportunity to advance himself. If you told McLeod anything in the morning, it was in print or in a lecture in his name by the evening. He was grasping, selfish, deceptive, self-seeking and empty of truth. He had a selfish, overpowering ambition. He was unscrupulous and would steal an idea or credit for work from any possible source. Like all bullies, McLeod was a coward and a skulking weakling if things did not go his own way. Now, I actually think that that little extract tells you an awful lot more about the inside of Fred Banting's head than it does about the character of John McLeod. Um, I think he's much maligned there in that passage. And it's quite ironic because had it not been for McLeod, Banting would probably never have won that Nobel Prize for insulin and would have remained a struggling GP in provincial Ontario. Because Banting had trained in medicine. He'd gone out to France in the First World War. He'd served in the medical corps on the Western Front, um, been wounded in action. Uh, he'd come back to Canada with medals on his chest. But very quickly, he found that having ribbons on your chest is no guarantee of an easy life on Civvy Street. He had this plan that he was gonna set himself up as a private doctor. That didn't work out, probably for the main reason that he didn't have that crucial factor, any patients coming to him. So to make ends meet, he began doing a bit of part-time lecturing uh, in the university. And he was going to bed one night with some bedtime reading that was guaranteed to cure insomnia. It was a, a paper on blockages in the pancreatic ducts. And he thought that this paper had given him a glimpse of how you might be able to isolate insulin. Now, the state of play at this time was a lot of people had already tried to, to find insulin. It had been hypothesized. It had been shown towards the end of the 19th century that if you remove the pancreas from a dog, the animal becomes diabetic. People began to speculate. Maybe the pancreas is producing a chemical messenger, a hormone that regulates blood sugar. If we could find that and inject it into diabetic patients, we'd have diabetes cracked. So the hunt went on to find it. And Banting thought this paper had given him an idea. So he took his idea to McLeod. And McLeod was, well, Banting didn't find his enthusiasm was re reciprocated. In fairness to McLeod, McLeod was just a cautious man. He didn't think that Banting had the requisite surgical skills to carry out the work that was being outlined. But nevertheless, he gave him the benefit of the doubt. So he gave him some space in his lab at the University of Toronto, and he teamed him up with a lab partner, young chap there on the left, finally your honours student, Charles Best. And the plan was basically this, that in the summer of 1921, Banting and Best would remove the pancreas from a dog to make the animal diabetic, and then they'd make some pancreatic extract, inject it into the poor artificial artificially made diabetic dog and see if that pancreatic extract would have an anti-diabetic effect plan was banting would do the surgery and best would carry out the measurements of blood glucose and a very romanticized mythology has grown up around that summer in 1921 it goes something like this that during that summer banting and best these two young inexperienced researchers triumphed against all the odds to come up with this miracle cure for diabetes well, in the early 80s, the late 
Canadian historian Michael Bliss wrote this fantastic book, The Discovery of Insulin. Bliss was the first person to really go back to the archives and take a look at Banting and Best's original lab notes. And what Bliss showed from those was that those early experiments of summer 1921 were often unreliable, inconsistent, poorly controlled. In other words, he took Bliss took a sledgehammer to that mythology that had grown up around Banting and Best. Now, all these things were pointed out to them by their boss, McLeod. McLeod had, had gone away for the summer on a fishing trip to Europe, but he was corresponding with Banting, and he was writing back to him, pointing out, saying, well, you know, have you done this control? And McLeod probably thought he was acting like a responsible supervisor should. Banting saw it very differently. His relationship with McLeod had not got off to a good start. It was getting steadily worse. He suspected that McLeod was out to steal his thunder for insulin. And things really came to a head by the end of that year, because December 1921, the boss McLeod thought that Banting and Best now had enough data to be able to get up and give a formal presentation of their work. So December 1921, they all headed to Yale University to give a presentation in front of the great and the good of North American diabetes research. The plan was that Banting was going to get up and give the presentation, which he did, and it it was pretty disastrous. He made a pig's ear of it. In his own journal, he says, you know, I, I got up and I was paralyzed by fear. It was as if the prestige of the audience had taken its toll on his nerves. He said the words just wouldn't come. You've got a picture. His boss, McLeod, is sitting in the audience just watching the whole thing, potentially going down in flames here. So he realizes he's got to do something. And he, he took over Banting's presentation and he fielded the questions from the audience at the end. And again, probably thought he was acting as a responsible supervisor should. Banting saw those actions, he interpreted those actions very differently. I mean, for him, it was confirmation of what he'd long feared, that basically McLeod was out to steal his glory for insulin. And he went away from that meeting fuming. He feared that insulin was slipping from his grasp and he realised what he needed to do was to do something that would stamp his authority on this discovery. And that something was to demonstrate that these pancreatic extracts didn't just have an anti-diabetic effect in a diabetic dog, but rather in a diabetic human patient. And the chance to do just that came in January 1922, when young chap here, 14 year old Leonard Thompson was brought into Toronto General Hospital by his dad. He's looking much better in that picture there than he did when his dad brought him into the hospital because at that time he was down to 65 pounds, his hair was falling out, he was lethargic, um, could barely speak, smelling of ketones. 11th of January, 1922, Leonard was injected with some of the pancreatic extract made by Banting and Best. And the result was disappointing. Sure, Leonard's blood sugar levels came down, but crucially, he didn't stop producing those poisonous ketones. Also of concern was the fact he suffered an adverse reaction. He came out in abscesses. And the reason for that was it was a reaction to impurities in the extract. Because you've got to remember, right, this extract is just mashed up pancreas injected in. Now, Banting and Best had realized there'd be a problem with this. They tried using alcohol to purify it, but quite obviously it wasn't enough. And when they actually published this work in a scientific journal, they said, you know, no clinical benefit was evidenced. Two weeks later, January the 23rd, 1922, Leonard's injected a second time. And this time it is a success. The blood sugar levels come down. Crucially, there's no production of ketones. And equally important, there's no, there's no toxic reaction to impurities. So what, what had changed in those two weeks? Well, what had changed was that second batch of extract hadn't been made by Banting and Best. It had been made by their colleague, James Collip. He was a biochemist. He'd come and joined the team from the University of Alberta. And Collip was an expert in purifying, and he had cracked how to use alcohol to remove these impurities from the preparation. Now, I can only really scratch the surface of the insulin story in this talk tonight, but if you want to know more about Collip, um, there was a really good Toronto Medical History Club had a fantastic conference back in May. There's the, all the talks are on YouTube. I'll put the links up later. Alison, historian Alison Lee gives a really good um, excellent talk on Collip. So that is worth checking out. But as a result of Collip's success, a few months later, May 1922, 
McLeod goes to Washington, D.C., and he formally announces, makes the first public announcement of the discovery of insulin. Interestingly, Banting and Best did not travel with him to that announcement. The excuse that Banting gave was that he couldn't afford the train fare, but I suspect it was the sour grapes with McLeod. As a result of that announcement, the accolades began to flood in for Banting. He got a pension from the Canadian government. He got an invitation from King George V to come and have tea at Buckingham Palace. And of course, then a year later, October 1923, comes the greatest accolade of all, the news that he's won the Nobel Prize, albeit jointly with MacLeod. And as I said, he was furious. And he wasn't the only person to be furious at that news because over in Germany, German clinician here in Berlin, Georg Zulzer, looked on with utter dismay when he heard that the Nobel had gone to Banting and MacLeod, because as far as he was concerned, he'd already discovered insulin back in 1908, when he'd made a pancreatic extract, tested it in patients, he maintained with some degree of success, been so confident about it, he'd filed a patent on it. And in that patent, crucially, he had highlighted the importance of removing impurities using alcohol. Uh, he'd called his substance a coma toll because he reckoned it could bring a diabetic patient out of a coma. Now, like Banting Best, he'd had a problem with side effects, but he'd managed to clean up his extract. And after a lot of struggling, he eventually got support from the Swiss company Hoffman La Roche, who by 1914 had built him a little laboratory. They teamed him up with a chemist, Camille Reuter. And by 1914, Reuter and Zilzer had prepared a pancreatic extract that they were really confident about. But the problem was this new extract was showing some strange new side effects. And those side effects were that when it was injected into test animals, the animals became convulsive and then they went into a coma um, after which they died. Hoffman LaRoche lost interest as a result of this. And then with the outbreak of the First World War, Zeltzer's insulin research came to an abrupt halt and it never recovered. After the war, the chaos Germany was in, he could never get his insulin research back on track. Then came the news that the Nobel had gone to Banting and MacLeod. And then another blow fell in quick succession because that's, that was when the penny dropped. Zeltzer realized the truth about these side effects that he'd observed with his last batch. You see, he had thought that those side effects of convulsion and coma had occurred because his batch still wasn't pure enough. But James Collip over in Canada had shown that as well as saving lives, insulin could take lives. Because Collip found if you inject purified insulin into a healthy test animal, it starts to become convulsive and then it falls into a coma. The reason that that's happening is the insulin is so pure that it's sending the blood sugar levels crashing through the floor into what we call hypoglycemic shock. Those symptoms of hypoglycemic shock were exactly what Zeltzer had seen with his last batch. In other words, that last batch that he'd obtained just before the outbreak of the war, those side effects of convulsion coma were not because his insulin was so impure. It was the opposite case. It was because his insulin was so potent that it was sending the animal's blood sugar crashing through the floor into hypoglycemia. In other words, 1914, he had in his hands a potent purified prep of insulin only to have it snatched out of his hands by world events well out of his control. And I think that's why Zilzer has been compared with a character in a Greek tragedy. So why is it then that we don't remember Georg Zilzer as the discoverer of insulin? Why is it that when quiz show host of the University Challenge, Jeremy Paxman, poses the question, name the discoverers of insulin, as he, as he did on the uh, most recent Christmas University Challenge series. The answer is buzzed back in correctly as Charles Best and Fred Banting. Well, the answer to that might have something to do with somebody else who was mightily put out by the award of the Nobel Prize to Banting, and that was his lab partner, Charles Best. Now, Banting always felt really guilty that Best hadn't received any award um, share of the Nobel Prize. So he, he very publicly announced that he would be splitting half of his Nobel Prize money with Best to try and make amends for this. If he was hoping that might placate Best, he would have been disappointed because over the years the, that followed, the relationship between the two men began to sour, uh, particularly as Banting accumulated more and more accolades. I think Best probably felt some degree of resentment. And early 1941, Banting was about to board 
a plane to go on a top secret wartime flight to the UK, because by this time he was probably the most eminent scientist in Canada. He'd become involved in uh, war work. And shortly before he boarded that plane, he offered his thoughts on BEST. Um, you can see them here. I'll let you read them yourself. I think that Banting's words there illustrate quite eloquently just how bad his relationship with BEST had become. What he could never have realized as he went to board that film was that plane story was just how tragically fateful those words would prove to be because shortly after takeoff from the airstrip in Newfoundland, the plane developed engine trouble. The pilot realized he was never gonna make it across the Atlantic. So he turned the plane around, but then the other engine began to pack up and the pilot had to make a crash landing in which Banting was killed. So McLeod had died a few years earlier, 1935. Of that original Toronto team of four, there's only two members left now, Charles Best and James Collip. And Charles Best was damn sure which of those two names the world was going to remember for the discovery of insulin. I mean, even before the death of Banting, Best had started to try and assert himself in this story. One way he'd done that was he co-authored a medical textbook that I think is, it was physiology for medical students. It's still in use today, Best and Taylor. I think it's on its 12th edition. But in a really early edition of that textbook, Best's passage on the discovery of insulin is very, very interesting. He mentions Zelter, but he just kind of dismissively says, yeah, he only got very suggestive results. You know, it was me and Banting, summer of 1921. We were the ones who discovered, discovered insulin. Well, the physicist turned philosopher Thomas Kuhn is probably more famous for that buzzword coming up with the idea of the paradigm shift. But um, he did also once warn about the pitfalls of learning your history of science from textbooks. And I think the case of Charles Best is a wonderful example why. Because if Charles Best was hoping that writing a textbook would be um, a route to scientific immortality, he would have been really disappointed to come across um, a contemporary undergraduate textbook of biochemistry in which the discovery of insulin is credited not to Frederick Banting and Charles Best, but to Frederick Banting and George Best. Now, if you're watching maybe on the other side of the Atlantic and you maybe don't get the cultural reference there, what I suggest you do if you get bored, get YouTube up and just Google um, an infamous 1990 interview uh, given to UK chat show host Terry Wogan. George Best was a very talented, but equally very troubled footballer. And um, the notion that he could also have been a medical pioneer is so absurdly surreal as to be worthy of Monty Python. When I came across this passage in this textbook in the medical library, I think it took me about five minutes to recover from laughing. And I was certainly getting some very odd looks from the library staff there. But Charles Best had other means at his disposal other than routes to scientific immortality in the pages of textbooks. As his star began to rise through the medical establishment of North America, he gave a number of addresses. And his account of the discovery of insulin there was interesting because the person who was conspicuous by his absence in those accounts was James Collip. Collip was effectively elbowed out by Best as Best sought to establish himself as the pivotal figure in the story. Now, the challenge Best had here is this. When do you actually say that insulin was discovered? Is it when you get a pancreatic extract that demonstrates an anti-diabetic effect in a, in a diabetic dog? Or is it when you've got a pancreatic extract that exerts anti-diabetic effect in a diabetic human patient? Initially, Best went for the latter, but then with time, people did begin to ask questions about the role of Collip. So he changed his strategy, backdate the discovery to that summer of 1921 when it was just him and Best, him and Banting, sorry, working on the dogs, Collip wasn't around. That seemed like a cast iron strategy, but there was a fatal flaw in the plan there because it turned out that that very summer, that very same summer, 1921, Someone else had done pretty much exactly the same experiments and by all accounts done them better, better controlled, more reliable, more consistent and published them in scientific journals. That someone was this Romanian researcher here, a guy called Nikolai Polescu. Like Zeltzer, he too was pretty furious at the news that the Nobel Prize had gone to Banting 
and MacLeod. He died in 1931, and to his dying day, he fought for international recognition for his role in the discovery of insulin. I always think that Palescu's story is a very good example of that old proverb, take care what you wish for. Because today he has got international recognition, but it's not for the discovery of insulin. Because in the early 2000s, the International Diabetes Federation were all set to honor Palescu with an honorary lecture and a bust. And then a news story broke from a French journalist and they received a fax from the Salmon Wiesenthal Center, which caused them to cancel everything. And <clears throat> what had been revealed was that as well as being a scientist, Palescu had been active in politics, very extremist, ugly, ultra-nationalist, anti-Semitic politics. It's said that his political writings had played a part in inciting the Holocaust in Romania, and he'd also been found a member of a number of ultra-nationalistic, anti-Semitic organizations that espoused violence against the Jewish population of Romania. As you can imagine, that put the International Diabetes Federation in a very difficult position. And they came to the conclusion that while they would recognize the role of Palescu in the discovery of insulin, they were not gonna celebrate this guy. I should say there are a lot of other contenders for the throne of insulin. I don't have time to go into them, but there are three of them here, Israel Kleiner at the Rockefeller Center. I mentioned the Toronto Medical History Club conference earlier. Again, I'll post up the link later. There's a fantastic talk on Israel Kleiner by Professor Jeffrey Friedman, of the Rockefeller Center, well worth checking out. Others include Ernest Lyman Scott and John Merlin. Now, shortly before, a few years before his death in 1978, Charles Best was actually asked about these people. He was asked to comment on their role in the discovery of insulin. His answer was interesting. He said, yeah, but none of them convinced the world of what they had. And this is the most important thing in any discovery. You've got to convince the scientific world. And we did. And there's Charles Best looking very happy with Sir Henry Dale of the Medical Research Council. He gets uh, an institute named after him. Now, Canadian historian Michael Bliss uh, had a very different perspective on Best's attempts to convince the scientific world. So here's Michael Bliss on Charles Best. At times, Best's distortions of the historic record seem to amount to deliberate unethical exercise in falsification, which verges on scientific fraud. In the later years of his life, Charles Best appears to have been deeply insecure about and obsessed with his role in history. He appears to have had a profound hunger for recognition, a serious ego problem. Ouch. It, it would be easy to go away tonight um, thinking of Charles Best as the villain of the piece, but I'm going to make, I, I don't know whether a plea in his defense is too strong. What I will say is this. I read a memoir by his son, and his son talked about an incident in 1964. By 1964, Best, Best was, you know, he was renowned in North American medical circles. His strategy had worked. He was famed as being the discoverer of insulin. He was doing world tours. He was giving lectures. He had the fame and the glory. And yet he was hospitalized with depression and had to have electroshock therapy. Uh, he'd gone to bed one night and uh, according to his son, they'd found um, a load of pharmaceuticals lined up next to his bed. So, you know, I joked earlier about Charles Best and George Best, but I do actually think on a more serious note, the two of them did have something sadly in common. They had their demons. And for all that Charles Best was there at the pinnacle of his career, bas basking in the glory and the fame of discovering insulin, Obviously, he'd had these demons festering away in the background, and I just wonder to what extent they had maybe shaped his earlier actions. Something else that Charles Best had recognized was a really important fundamental change in the culture of scientific practice. And it's that idea that you've got to go out there and convince the world. It's that idea that it's not just enough to be doing your experiments in the lab. You've got to be going out there, blowing your trumpet about those experiments you're doing in the lab. By the time Best died in 1978, scientists were really beginning to learn the importance of that. And they had, by that time, they had a powerful tool to enable them to do that. It was the press conference. And September 1978, a team from City of Hope Hospital in California and 
the newly formed biotech company that I mentioned earlier, Genentech, gave a, they, got in, they got up in front of the TV cameras to give a press conference to announce that they'd done this amazing thing. They had basically genetically engineered common bacterium to produce human insulin. Uh, they'd been able to do that because of a new technology discovered around about the start of the 70s, which enabled you to physically chop a piece of DNA out of one organism and physically stitch it to the DNA of another to make a hybrid or what we call a recombinant DNA molecule. I think what's really amazing about Genentech's achievement is that they did this as a rank outsider in a three horse race. And the two main runners in that race were two big academic heavyweights in the US. Out on the East Coast, we had Walter Gilbert, known by one of his graduates as the Sorcerer. And over on the West Coast in California, Bill Rutter, and these two were racing head to head to try and take the chunk of DNA that tells a human pancreas cell how to make insulin and physically stitch it into a common gut bacteria, a process we call cloning. Now, <clears throat> the way that they were trying to do that, so we have to have a little bit of biochemistry, but I promise it won't be too heavy. So basically, proteins, proteins are more than just you know, an essential dietary component. They're more than just a nice slab of meat or a nice slab of tofu on your dinner. They are nature's nano machines, right? They are the workhorses of living things. So hemoglobin that carries oxygen around your blood's a protein. Rhodopsin in the back of your eyes a protein. Enzymes that speed up biochemical reactions in your digestion are all protein. And insulin's a protein. DNA in the cell carries the information to make proteins. DNA sits in the nucleus of the cell and the proteins are manufactured outside in the cytoplasm of the cell. So how does the information get from DNA physically to where the proteins have to be made? Well, it does that because the information in DNA is copied into a messenger molecule called RNA. And of course, now, thanks to COVID, we're all familiar with RNA because it's the, the root of some of the COVID vaccines. So what those two academic heavyweights, Gilbert and Goodman, were trying to do they were trying to fish out from human cells the RNA message for human insulin. And that was not easy. The best way, the best analogy I can use for that is it's not just looking for a needle in a haystack. You are looking for a needle in a field full of cellular haystacks. But, you know, the biggest challenge they faced probably wasn't a technical one. It was a cultural and political one. And it was this. This new technology I mentioned that enabled you to stitch piece of DNA from one organism to another had people frightened. The media and the public were frightened. And, you know, understandably so, right? Because people were saying, well, hang on a minute. What if that means you take a chunk of DNA that causes cancer in, in humans and you physically stitch it into the common cold virus? Where will that leave us? So this is an example of the kind of cartoon you'll get in newspapers of the time showing a, a stereotype, wild-eyed, Mad scientist straight out of a Hollywood B-movie racing into his lab, being greeted by an assortment of genetic mutants. This is what the scientists involved in this work were, were up against. Now, because of these fears, the work they were doing was subject to really strict regulation that had actually been drawn up by the scientists involved in the work themselves. And those regulations said this, that if you were going to take a piece of human DNA with the information to make insulin and you're going to put it into a, a bacterium, you had to do that work in the highest level of biosecurity and biosafety, what we call category four. So to give you an idea for what that looks like, this is what category four facilities look like. We are talking moon suits, airlocks, negative pressure rooms. These are the kind of facilities that you would work on, say, smallpox or Ebola virus. And that is where the academic groups would have to do their work. And there was only one facility in the U.S., with that kind of kit, and that was the Department of Defense facility at Fort Detrick in Maryland. And there's no way that the Department of Defense were going to let um, a load of molecular biologists run rampant in their labs. So basically, the West Coast and East Coast lab had to go abroad to do this work, which meant they had to prepare all their solutions and reagents meticulously in the US and then get them on the plane. The East Coast lab, Walter the Gilbert's lab, actually came to Britain. They were granted use of the um, Ministry of Defense's labs at Port and Down. So they spent weeks kitted up in moon suits, going in and out of airlocks, doing all this stuff, only to get the phone call that they'd been beaten to it, not by their rivals on the West Coast, but by the scientists at Genentech. <laughs> 
So here's Herb Boyer. He was one of the founders of Genentech. Um, this photograph taken here, he's looking very worried. He's worried about those strict regulations governing um, recombinant DNA work because he basically fears they're going to kill off molecular biology at birth. A few years later, he's beaming out of the front cover of Time magazine. Um, so much so, so important now, so prominent that the news that Lady Diana Spencer's going to marry Prince Charles is just squashed up into the top right hand corner. Um, and the reason for that is the success of Genentech. Uh, I like to think that there's an unsung hero in the story of Genentech, and it's sheep, or rather their wool. And that is all thanks to these two guys here Archer Martin on the left and Richard Singh who were working in Leeds in the 1940s at the Wool Industries Research Association labs. Um, when I was researching, doing research for the book, I found a journal kept by Richard Singh describing uh, the time that he and Archer Martin were housemates. It struck me that Martin and Singh were very much in 1940s, um, Sheldon Cooper and Leonard Hofstadter from the hit sitcom science program, Big Bang Theory, which I reckon has to be one of the best pieces of science communication I've ever seen. But my colleague Greg, Greg Raddick says we should think of them as being the, uh, the other great Leeds M&S story um, in a nod to that, uh, that famous high, uh, high street retailer for which uh, Leeds is famous. So what did they do? Well, <clears throat> to understand that, we need another little detour, not to 1940s Leeds, but now just a quick nip out into outer space. A few years ago, scientists were getting really excited when um, the Rosetta probe found traces on a distant comet of a little chemical called glycine. Now, why did that get hearts beating? Well, glycine belongs to a class of chemicals called amino acids. And uh, promise you, we won't get too heavy on the chemistry here tonight. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. There are about 20 different amino acids, all with different chemical properties. Think of them, though, as chemical beads of different shapes, sizes, and colors. And you can string those chemical beads together to form a giant molecular necklace, which is a protein. So think of proteins as being a big, long molecular necklace formed by these beads of different colors, shapes, and sizes. And at the time, although people knew proteins were really important in living systems, they didn't really know how these amino acids came together to form proteins. Well, someone who played a big role in providing an answer to that was William Asprey here in Leeds. Through his X-ray work on the proteins in wool fibers, he showed that the amino acids are joined together to form these great big long chains, these molecular necklaces. But that raised another question. Are these molecular beads that form the necklace arranged in any particular order? And that's what Martin and Singh were working at in these state-of-the-art cutting-edge facilities that you can see here. So these two structures are all that remains of what used to be the um, technical headquarters of the Wool Industries Research Association on Headingley Lane in Leeds. About halfway between the Hyde Park and the original Oak pubs. And you've got a picture, Martin and Singh, working away in this building that used to be a former stable, breathing in lungfuls of chloroform as they developed um, a separation method for separating out the different amino acids in wool proteins. So the way they did that was <clears throat> they break down the proteins, so you get lots of different amino acids, and then you separate them out simply using some filter paper and a couple of different solvents and they separate out as blobs moving up the filter paper. Basically, it's chromatography. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, you know, kids have all done at key stage three. Martin and Singh developed a slightly more sophisticated version of it. Um, but the impact of that work was to go much, much further than just analyzing the chemical composition of wool, because Martin and Singh realized that they could use this method not just to work out the different types of beads in the protein necklace, but to work out their precise linear order. And they gave that order a new name. They called it sequence. And that idea of sequence has come to be at the heart of molecular biology today. Now, the problem they had here was the proteins in wool were too big for them to work out the complete order of these um, molecular beads. So what they needed was something smaller made of amino acids. They tested it on an antibiotic, gramicidin S, that was made of amino acids and helping them with that were two rising young stars in biochemistry, both of whom went on to distinguish themselves in the field of insulin. We've got Dorothy Hodgkin here on the left, who won the 1964 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for working out the structure of penicillin and vitamin B12. 
Five years later, she cracked the 3D structure of the insulin protein using x-rays. Working, also working with Singh on the problem was young Fred Sanger. And Sanger decided he was going to try and use Martin and Singh's method to work out the complete order of amino acid beads in the insulin molecular necklace. And after about 10 years of hard work, he cracked it. He did it. The Times newspaper called it basically his four minute mile, a reference to uh, the achievement by athlete Sir Roger Bannister. And here's the page from Sanger's notebook. Now, <clears throat> Sanger had shown there that the beads, if you like, in the insulin necklace are arranged in a particular order. That raises another question. What is it that determines that order? Well, today, I guess everyone knows DNA does something really important in biology. But back then in the 1940s, very different situation. Most people thought DNA was just a really boring molecule. Of course, today we know different, thanks to films like Jurassic Park and things like that. The double helix has entered popular consciousness um, as an icon. Somebody who did think DNA might be doing something interesting was this scientist here, Owen Shargath. He had an idea that maybe the chemical rungs what we call the bases that form the chemical rungs of the DNA ladder, four different ones shown here in different colors, green, red, blue, yellow, maybe somehow they carry the genetic information. Um, and to put that to the test, he wanted to take DNA from different species and separate out those four rungs. Problem he faced was a technical one. There was no method of separation with enough precision to enable him to do that at the time until Archer Martin came to Columbia and he gave a seminar on the development of that separation method that he and Singh had developed down the road in Headingley for the analysis of wool. And Shargaff realized then he had exactly what he needed. And using that method, he gave the first hint that DNA may carry the genetic information through the order of these bases. And it's those are two pillars on which the genetic scientists really built their success. Because if you know the order of the molecular beads that make up the insulin necklace, then you can work backwards and you can deduce the order of rungs in the DNA ladder that specify that information. Insulin is not a big protein. It's only 51 of these little amino acids actually arranged into two chains, actually not one. But because it's not a big protein, because it's only 51 of those, it means it's really not many rungs on the DNA ladder. In fact, it's such a short stretch of DNA that you can actually, at the lab bench, synthesize it using organic chemistry, build it up rung by rung by rung. And that's exactly what the scientists at Genentech did. Now, because they did that, because they did it that way, the DNA they had synthesized, because they made it artificially at the lab bench, it didn't class technically as human DNA, it classed as synthetic DNA. And here's why that's important. Because of that, they were not bound by the regulations that said, you've got to do this work in a top security Ebola smallpox level laboratory. In other words, they didn't have to don moon suits, go in airlocks, even buy an airline ticket to fly port to port and down. They could basically do this work at the lab bench in biosafety conditions that were probably on a par with those in a dental surgery. And that's how come they were able to beat those two academic labs to take in a piece of human DNA that carried the instructions for insulin and slotting it into a recombinant bacterium. So here are the two guys who founded Genentech. We've got venture capitalist Bob Swanson on the left, Herb Boyer on the right. This is a statue on the Genentech campus that immortalizes their first meeting. Um, Swanson had called Boyer up. He'd cold called him out of the blue with the idea of setting up a biotechnology company to make human insulin using genetically engineered bacterium. Boyer's immortal line was, yeah, I can give you 10 minutes on a Friday afternoon. I, those 10 min minutes turned into a, an evening down a bar in San Francisco. And a few years later, Genentech made what was then the most spectacular debut on Wall Street. I think the shares started trading at $39, rocketed up to 81, closed at 79. By the end of that day, Boyer and Swanson were multimillionaires. Apparently, Boyer went out at the end of that day's trading and he bought himself a Porsche. A lot of people have said he should have got the Nobel Prize. I like to think that maybe he reflected on just how much happiness the Nobel Prize had brought Fred Banting and concluded he was much better off with his shiny new Porsche. 
Two people who did get the Nobel Prize were Archer Martin and Richard Singh back in 1952. Here's a headline from the Yorkshire Post, Nobel Prize for Leeds Invention, and a slightly more memorable one from the News Chronicle, Blobs win Nobel Prize for two young scientists, a reference to those coloured blobs on the chromatogram. And so, of course, a few years back when Leeds Phil and Lit celebrated their bicentenary in 2019, uh, here's our very own Chris Hatton, when he was president unveiling a brand new landmark for the, uh, the Otley Road pub run, uh, a blue plaque on that gatepost outside where the wire facility stood, honouring the achievements of Martin and Singh. And then um, I like to think that all those hordes of fancy dress clad revellers, uh, as they make their way down from Hed Headingley to a night of carnage in the city's flesh pots, might just maybe stop for a minute and just reflect on the, the amazing things that happened on that site before the inebriation sets in. I was actually going down there a few weeks back on Saturday night, and I saw one, one guy as he uh, as he passed as he passed this site, he slurped the last dregs from his can of lager, and then he chucked the empty can over the wall to land right in the ruin of Martin and Singh's laboratory. And I did toy with the idea of just stopping and saying, "Do you realise you've just desecrated a shrine in the history of molecular biology? You know that the site where the 1952 Nobel Prize was won." But um, thankfully, discretion was the better part of valor there. And I didn't do that. Otherwise I would probably have been delivering this talk from my bed in the Leeds General Infirmary. So I think the Martin and Singh story shows me what I love about science. It's the adventure of it. You can start doing work that seems to be so far removed from the glamor of biomedical research, research into the chemistry of wool in an old stable. And you end up unraveling the chemical structure of insulin and the first hints at how DNA carries the genetic message. But it's important to say, you know, insulin raised an awful lot of questions, not scientific ones, political and social ones. Here are some of the headlines appearing in the press at the time of the discovery of insulin, and they're all very triumphant, talk of a miracle cure. But straight away, the questions began to arise. Who's going to pay for this stuff? How is its production going to be regulated? Crucially, who's going to take responsibility for administering it? Should it be diabetes specialists? Should it be GPs? Should it, shock horror, be patient? And those kind of political questions are still with us today. Here's a headline from The Guardian a few years ago, diabetes killing African children. So the issue here is access to insulin. It's all very well in the industrialized developed world. We can make recombinant human insulin using genetically engineered bacterium, but access to insulin in the developing world is still a real problem. We could probably fill a whole talk on that. Um, a number of clinicians are getting together to address that. But I just wanted to give you this example to show you that political and social questions are still here with us. Those triumphal headlines that I saw mentioned there um, on the previous slide are also important in another way. Because while the media were proclaiming insulin as a miracle cure for diabetes, the clinicians at the time, like Elliot Jocelyn, knew that it was nothing of the sort. What it did was it transformed an otherwise fatal condition into one, a chronic long-term one that could be managed, albeit with potential for serious complications. Elliot Jocelyn himself said, insulin is a remedy for the wise and not the foolish, be they patients or doctors. He said, everyone knows that you need insulin to live with diabetes, but to live well with diabetes requires brains. And I think I, I understand what he means now, having had this condition myself for 10 years, you know, I can inject myself with insulin four times a day and I'll keep myself alive, but to live well, I need to be doing more than that. I need to be thinking about lifestyle, activity, diet. In other words, the technology is only effective as my behavior allows it to be. Looking to the future, Outside the former house of Fred Banting in Toronto, there is a flame that is kept burning constantly. It's called the flame of hope. If I've understood this correctly, on the day that diabetes is finally cured, that flame is going to be extinguished. So I just wanted to sort of conclude with looking at a few ways that that might happen. One method is the artificial pancreas. So we're talking here about an insulin pump that's rigged up to a continuous glucose monitoring system. Developments in artificial intelligence are coming into that. We've also got the advent of smart insulins. So after the, after the breakthrough of getting bacteria to make human insulin, the next step, which came on in the 1990s, 
was insulins in which the some of the beads in that molecular chain had been deliberately altered using genetic engineering to make either faster or slower acting insulins that allow a patient to fine tune their blood sugar control. The next step is what we call smart insulins. These are insulins that have had a module, a molecular module bolted onto them so they can actually sense blood sugar and modulate their activity in response to that. But I guess these two are still only ways of managing diabetes. What we really want is to beat, the, beat this thing once and for all. I think the smart money might be on stem cell treatment there, stem cells, re, using stem cells to regrow the cells in the pancreas, the islet cells that make the insulin that have been destroyed, or using immunotherapy to modulate the body's immune system so it's not attacking those insulin producing cells. But even when diabetes is vanquished, I think the story of insulin is going to have a lesson for us. And it goes back to that lesson about technology is only as effective as our behavior allows it to be. I think that's a much broader lesson you know whether we're talking about challenges like climate change obviously it's going to be it's going to be taken on with things like electric cars and carbon capture but equally it needs us to remember to be turning off the lights and trying to use a bike when we can similarly global pandemics the vaccines are to be welcomed they're great but as well it needs us to play our bit the vaccines are only going to be effective at bringing these beasts under control if we know when to deploy masks and social distancing. So it's a partnership between technology and our behavior. I realize you've all sat patiently for ages now, so I'm gonna wrap up in a minute. Um, one final note, I called my book, Insulin, the Crooked Timber, why the title? Well, these past couple of years, you know, we've all become experts on, we've all become aware of the impact and importance of science in our lives as we sat listening to news reports, and uh, graphs every night and talk of PCR and mRNA and things like this. There is this tendency, I think, to see scientific progress as being, as being done by these giants, these geniuses who tower above the rest of us shouting Eureka. Um, and I blame that partly on Sir Isaac Newton for that, that line, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, which apparently he wasn't being original when he said that. Um, he'd nicked it from um, 12th century philosopher, Bernard of Chartres. I don't think that's a helpful way of looking at science. I think <clears throat> 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant gives us a much more authentic account of the progress of science when he said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Now, I don't think he was actually talking about science when he said that, but I think it's a much more honest account of science. That Certainly the path to insulin was a crooked path. It was trod by equally crooked individuals by which I don't mean that they were criminal, what I mean is they were flawed, complex human beings, as we all are, like Fred Banting, who became so depressed in March 1922 that he took to stealing alcohol from his lab and confessed that there wasn't one night that month that he went to bed sober because he was so worried about the glory for insulin being nicked from him. It's done by flawed, complex individuals. And you know what? Maybe that is what makes their achievements all the more impressive. So I'm just going to wrap up. There's a lot of acknowledgements and thank yous. I want to thank all the archivists who helped me with, with all this. Um, David Allen, uh, Natalia Rattan in, in Toronto, Adam Green at Trinity College, um, former employees of WIRA, Christine Holdstock, Marion Dougal, and, and uh, Noreen Barrett, uh, Professor Pierre Lefebvre of the IDF, Professor Sally Smith-Hughes, who was so helpful on the history of Genentech, um, and of course my, uh, my editors and, and publicists at Oxford University Press, Sonka and Jessica, but the biggest thank you of all goes to yourselves for sitting there so patiently tonight and giving up a lovely summer evening to listen to me harping on. And to lead, a special thanks to Leeds, Phil and Lit for all the support they gave in helping me do the research for this book. Uh, they very kindly gave me a grant so I could go down to Cambridge and dig around in the archives of Richard Singh. So I am going to shut up there because you have all sat patiently enough. I'm just going to say thanks once again to you um, and wrap up. Um, well, thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, would you like to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, that's an idea, isn't it? Let's do that. Let's do that. And we can allow. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, actually. I'm going to, I promised you, I'm going to post those two YouTube talks by Jeffrey Friedman and Alison Lee because they really are, they really are worth seeing. So I'm going to stop okay. sharing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> right.
So if anybody's got any questions, if I haven't stunned you all into silence, please do feel free to fire away. We're letting you concentrate for a moment on what you're doing. Oh, no, that's very well. I can't multitask. You're right. No, that is why. Yeah, I can't. Well, you can because you're off. No, no, I can't believe your voice me. Suffer, but, uh... Walking and chewing gum. Right. They're in the chat. So um, okay. take a look at those. Uh, great. So. Um, well, well uh, people can put questions in the chat. And uh, Rachel and I will have a keep an eye on the chat, uh, and uh, uh, you can also turn your microphones and ask questions uh, to to Kirsten. Um, Kirsten, can I first of all thank you for a fascinating uh, uh, and tremendously lucid talk. Wow. Uh, you, you've taken us uh, for, from uh, you know d uh, diseases that could only be uh, the, whose cause could only be imagined to um, you know, high-tech therapies and uh, fascinating insights into the characters who, uh, who, who shaped all of this. Well, thanks, Eric. But like I said, this talk can only scratch the surface. I mean, there's almost like three talks. You know, the discovery of insulin is a talk in itself. Martin and Singh is a talk in itself. Genentech's a talk in itself. And I can only scratch the surface. And seriously, if people want to know more, check out those conference talks from that, that conference in Toronto. Um, because they're, I've been work, working my way through them. Um, they're really worth yeah. it. They're great because you can go off and explore all these different aspects of the insulin story through those. So, um, yeah. I will. I think I put them out on my Twitter feed tomorrow, so uh, today, so that my my multitudinous hundred Twitter followers can um, partake <laughs> of them. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to amplify the messages. Yeah. And... Cheers, Rachel. Cheers, Rachel. I, I haven't got the hang of all this Twitter malarkey, really. You know. Can I maybe start off a question? Uh, I mean, to, to what extent did Banting and Best um, commercialise their, their, their discovery? Because, I mean, every discovery like that nowadays is instantly commercial. I mean, you can't mm. even talk about it until you check it with the, uh, the IP people yeah. at the university. Uh, that, that obviously didn't uh, pertain in these times, but uh, obviously the, the, there was a very big supply of of pig insulin, uh, I think, came from Denmark, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. Pig insulin came along. Uh, I mean, did, did, have you looked at, you, you know, what, what kind of connections they had with, uh, you know, production of insulin for medical use? Yeah, right. It's a great question, Eric. Right. So we've got to break that one down a little bit. So commercialization. The University of Toronto was quick to file a patent on insulin. And here's why, right? They were very clear to state, we are not filing this patent because we want to profit commercially from it. The reason they filed the patent was, you know, I mentioned that discovery by James Collip that insulin was dangerous as well. Yes. They realized that we've got a real problem here, right? Because if we publish the method to produce this stuff, and it's it basically it's thrown out there. So anyone, any old quack can now cook this stuff up in their backyard. We're going to have people, we're going to have patients dying because it's not been standardized, right? The dosage hasn't been standardized, right? Yeah. So the University of Toronto said, we're going to file this patent. We're going to, they called it a defensive patent. We're filing it, not because we want to get minted out of it, but what we want to do is we want to regulate the, manu the, the manufacture and production of this stuff and then license it out to make it safe. So that was their main concern there. Um because they thought we've got to, if we maintain control of it, so for instance, they licensed it out to the MRC. So that's why the patent was filed. Banting, Banting didn't want his name to be on the patent initially. He just thought it would get complex. So his name wasn't added. It, originally, it was just Best, Collett, McLeod, a few others. Um, how did it get commercialized? Right, you know, you know, I said that they went to that uh, conference at the University of Yale where Banting made a right pig's ear of his presentation. There was a silver line into that cloud because sitting in the audience was a guy called George Clues, and he was uh, very senior at the pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly. And despite Banting making a real hash of the presentation, Clues, he had enough insight to see that there was something big brewing up here. So he basically got on the phone to McLeod and said, Right, 
you know, you guys have got something really interesting at the lab bench. But if you want to scale this up and start getting into patients, you're going to need industrial clout. And we want to give you that. And McLeod, you know, McLeod was always very cautious. So he was a bit reluctant at first. But I mean, a few months down the line, he was on the phone to Clues again and, and said, yeah, let's go for it. So basically, very quickly, very quickly, the Toronto team had the industrial clout of Eli Lilly behind them. And I, mean, I think really, thinking to, thinking to characters like Zoltzer, you know, what was it the Canadians had that Zilzer didn't have? I think it was two things, and they weren't necessarily scientific. I think, one, they had the media, and two, they had industrial clout. I mean, this is not a sour grapes thing. This is not like, you know, it's just a, it's an observation. I yeah. think that was that was really important. Um, and once Eli Lilly were in on the act, they were able to improve the purification process. So you didn't need, the, the, didn't need all this business with alcohol. They found a way of doing it using the isoelectric method. So mm -hmm. but again, that's probably another whole talk. So I hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, interesting about patents as protection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were really clear. We're doing it from a safety point of view. Yeah. We yeah. don't want people dying. You know, if, if, if production of this thing is unregulated, people are going to die, was their line on it. So if we file a patent and we have control, okay. we can protect yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Kirsten, a, a point that uh, you made very forcefully amongst many well put points was that technology is only as effective as our behaviour allows it to be. And you'll remember from uh, Kath Noakes' Priestley lecture last yeah. year, that was such a strong conclusion from her work on ventilation. Absolutely. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of that. Yeah. It yeah. really was, wasn't it? Really yeah. interesting. And so the whole sort of socio-psychological, yeah. economic um, complex within which these things happen and the personalities of the people involved can either uh, push people forward or, or get things mired or, you yeah. know, for these incredible complexities. So, yeah, really fascinating. What a story. Yeah. So you can't, you know, you can't see the science in isolation from the, the bigger social political context that it's in it's embedded in you know and it's really interesting to look at the debates that were going on pretty quickly about like you know who's going to pay for this insulin and um it's, i mean so, some of the exchanges are really quite memorable um well yeah. in indeed um i, I would uh, i think we're probably running out of time almost are, are we eric what do you think uh because it's quite well, it's got a, a a question we, we can we can deal yeah. with it in there a, isn't another in question in the chat, but does anybody want to unmute and actually ask it in yeah. person yeah I, I was going i was going to if we have more time i was going to ask you about the whole the notion of discovery when mm. it's actually you know it's like uh, as a geographer i would say well look um who discovered australia you know it'd been there yeah. all the time kind of thing yeah, it's a classic one in science. So, um, you know, I always think the analogy is, I think, um, do you know, might have been Alison Lee in her Toronto talk made this, this comparison. The other one to think about is the discovery of penicillin. Because that's really, you know, um, I was helping, I was helping my oldest son revise for his end of year 10 exams. We're doing biology. And there's this question, um, you know, who discovered penicillin? And we've got these revision, the back of the school revision card. I turn it over. And I'm saying to my boy, like, if it says Alexander Fleming, you know, like, they're wrong. I turn it over, it's Alexander Fleming. It's like, no, it wasn't. Like, Fleming had the dishes with the mould was growing on, and he noticed the mould's killing the bacterium. But that was just an observation. That was empiricism. It was Howard Florian, Ernst Shen, who did the donkey work, who actually isolated the active agent mm -hmm. and shows it's penicillin. And I, I think it's very similar in the insulin story. Yeah, you can make a diabetic extract and you can see it's got an effect, but then it's who who actually actually isolated that active agent. And um, yeah, I mean, the accreditation of priority uh, in scientific discovery is something that's going to keep historians and philosophers in, in, in science in jobs for a long, long time, I think. I'm sure. um, that's going to be I'm a sure there's um, a massive literature on the perverse effects of the very existence of the Nobel Prize system. Yeah, do you know, Rachel? It's really good. Good point. You say that. So there is um, there's an eminent uh, professor of medicine, diabetes specialist, um, Professor Alberti, and he wrote this great paper on that subject. And he, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he basically said, you know, the Nobel Prize just just brings more grief they should get rid of it and he says 
I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, "It's quite refreshing. It's quite refreshing not to be, um, not to be like smart enough to be considered for the running for a Nobel." You know, it's not fine by me. I just thought that was a very funny line from him. <laughs> I, think, really, right? I mean, the more you dig, I mean, the, the DNA story is the classic one. You know, the acrimony over that. Um, there'll be loads of other ones once you start digging. Mm. Um. Anyway, that's, that's just reminding me, by the way, another link to your talk, but this is leaping ahead of Eric, but I'll, I'll just do my little bit about future talks because you mentioned mm. Dorothy Hodgkin and we are going to have, on mm. the 5th of September, we'll have um, a historian of science called Georgina Ferry talking oh, okay. about Dorothy Hodgkin, so that'll be good. Um, our next event is going to be uh, on the 20th of July with uh, Professor uh, Craig Jordan talking about the development of tamoxifen. So we've got two very Im immense uh, 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 elements of 20th century science, one after another. And um, uh, and if you want to see the other events that we've got lined up for the rest of the year, if you go to the events page of the Phil and Lit website and scroll down, there's a slide that uh, gives you all the, the, the titles and dates. Um, and they will be put up on the website. Uh, but we're still in this thing where, you know, for special reasons tonight, um, Kirsten wanted to do this still online. Uh, we haven't yet got the final travel details from Professor Jordan, partly because things are still, you know, kind of, well, he's not yet up in the air, shall we say. <laughs> uh, so we'll take things one at a time. OK, so Eric, I'll hand uh, back to you now. Well, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Rachel. I, I think it just really remains for me to... Uh, Kirsten, th thank you again uh, for, on behalf of us all for a, uh, a wonderful talk. Um, uh, so many messages coming in on the chat saying how, how much people have enjoyed your talk, uh, what great talks you give, and uh, I, uh, how they've learned a lot from the talk. And I think no matter who we are or what our specialty is, I think there's, there's been something in, the, in this talk that we've, that we've all learned from. And thank you very much uh, for, for giving it, particularly uh, at such short notice. Uh, hey, no problem. I, actually, do you know what, Eric? The, the timing worked out wonderfully because this week, according to the Diabetes UK charity website, this week is officially Diabetes Week. So mm -hmm. the, the stars were in alignment, right? Fantastic. So no, yeah. thank, thank you. No, thanks okay. to you all. The 200 year old organization, we're absolutely on the button. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. I'll stop recording now. Okay.